Hello everyone, I'm Curmudgeon, and today I'm going to be breaking down one of the most shocking unsolved cases around, the story of the so-called Mad Killers of Brabant. If you're unfamiliar with this story, which would not surprise me because I had to dig through a bunch of old French websites to find details about it, then prepare yourself because it gets really crazy really, really fast. Well, I'm going to go ahead and set the stage for you. It's the start of the 1980s, and for an average Belgian citizen, life's going pretty slow. However, within just a couple of years, a wave of violence would terrorize the country. In the spring of 1982, a gang known as the Brabant Killers, or the Mad Killers of Brabant, would appear and progressively become more bold, more aggressive, and more violent over the years. No one knew when they would strike, but everyone knew one thing, that no one was safe. The first crime attributed to the Brabant Killers occurred on the afternoon of March 13th in 1982, when two men enter a gun store and, taking advantage of the gunsmith's preoccupation in a back room, simply walk out with a hunting rifle and two other guns. Witnesses describe one of the men as being young with nearly blonde hair. This man was also noted to be particularly tall, earning him the title of The Giant. The other man was reported to be older with graying hair, earning him the nickname the old man, which, if I'm being honest, if I was starting a crime spree with my buddy and the police gave him the name, the giant, and then turned around and gave me the nickname, the old man, uh, I'd be I'd be pretty ticked. <laughs> a couple of months later in May, two men seize an Austin Allegro from its driver at gunpoint. The two men are described as being in their 40s. One is tall, with black hair and a mustache. The car they stole, however, was running on empty and was in pretty bad condition, so the men were forced to abandon the vehicle in favor of another. Once the men abandoned the Allegro, they forced open the lock to a Volkswagen dealership. There, they steal a blue Volkswagen Santana. This is the car that would later be used to facilitate the gang's first major violent crimes. On August 14th of 1982, two armed men break into a supermarket in Maubeuge, France. They begin to steal food, wine, champagne, and foie gras. An anonymous phone call to the police notifies them of the robbery, and three officers show up to the scene. Immediately, both robbers open fire. Two of the officers are seriously wounded, allowing the robbers to escape. Fortunately, both officers survive. Unfortunately, this places them in the minority of those who attracted the violence of the Brabant killers. While many may have originally thought this to be an isolated incident, time quickly proved otherwise. Just a month and a half later, on September 30th of 1982, the crime spree of the mad Brabant killers would kick into high gear when three armed men would storm a weapons dealership in, I'm gonna try it, Wavre, Belgium. They immediately gathered as many firearms as they possibly could, forcing the gunsmith and his two customers to the floor. Before the three men could make their escape, they were immediately confronted by a police officer. Immediately, they opened fire upon him, killing him. Seeing that their luck had turned, the three robbers made their escape in the same Volkswagen Santana that had been used in the grocery store robbery. However, this time their getaway was not as clean. In fact, as they left, they were immediately followed by the gendarmerie, basically think France and Belgium SWAT teams. This turned out to be an intense chase, and in an attempt to end it, the gendarmerie opted to create a roadblock using one of their vehicles. They parked cars across the route that the Brabant killers were expected to take in their escape. Their prediction turned out to be right as the killers started to drive down the road towards the roadblock. However, they could not have been prepared for the absolutely backcrap crazy plan that the robbers decided to go with because do you want to know what they decided to do? Uh, do you think they maybe tried going off-road? No. Instead, they decided that the best idea was to just floor it and they rammed into the roadblock at high speed and then immediately just opened up guns blazing on all of the cops nearby. Well, even more crazy than that is the fact that it absolutely worked out for them. That's right, after ramming into this barricade at high speed, then engaging in a massive firefight, the Brabant killers seriously wounded two of the gendarmerie and managed to make a big enough opening to escape and they were not caught. Now, at this point, you're probably wondering the same thing that I was, which is, how did some two-bit thugs manage to outgun and outmaneuver not only the regular everyday police, but also the Belgium's paramilitary, the gendarmerie? Well, that really gets to the heart of what makes this case so interesting. You see, in many of the encounters with the Brabant killers, police noted that the way they fought was not like your average criminal. Instead, they employed tactics and strategies that the police themselves were taught to use inside of firefights. It's one of the main reasons why they were able to shoot their way out of being captured so many times. And it's something that led many to suspect that the Brabant killers actually had ties with the police themselves. On December 23rd, the police would discover the body of a taxi driver 
and one final murder would be attributed to the Brabant killers. That is to say, one final murder in the year of 1982. Just like that, the year was over and the police were no closer to making an arrest. Horrifically enough, despite all the awful things that had happened that year, the story wasn't even close to being over, and it was going to get much, much worse. I have to concede that in 1983, the list of crimes attributed to the Brabant killers was so long that for me to actually cover all of them in depth, we would be here all day. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to hit the major highlights and kind of skim over some of them. And I think that'll be enough for us to piece together the full story and to have a little bit of a discussion about why this actually happened and what was going on. So the first major crime of 1983 was on February 11th. This marks the start of a spree of supermarket robberies, which I think you'll come to find are really the bread and butter of what crimes the Brabant killers were committing. The first of these robberies occurred in Rixensart, the next in Uckel, then in Hall, and finally, one robbery occurred in Huding Guchnis. I'm not sure how to pronounce that, even though I looked up the pronunciation, so uh, that's the best you're probably going to get out of me. Then, they shifted focus. On the 10th of September, the gang's next target was a textile factory in Timts, Belgium. The robbery began with the killer shooting the receptionist to death and gravely injuring another bystander. The sounds of gunshots alerted nearby neighbors who took to their windows to find out what the cause of the commotion was. However, their curiosity drew gunfire from within the building. Thankfully, nobody was injured. However, the robbery was successful and the gang got away with everything they needed. Now, I hear you asking, why would this gang that's previously just been robbing supermarkets suddenly switch and rob a textile factory of all places? If you don't know, textile factories make fabric. That's because this specific textile factory had just taken up a new project one for the Belgian police. The new product that they were making for the police was bulletproof vests. You see, I believe at this point the killers were already planning to get a lot bolder and to take even bigger risks, and that these vests were going to help facilitate them taking those bigger risks. I've even heard some contention about whether or not the fact that this factory was making bulletproof vests was information that would have been available to the public, or if it was something that only people inside of the police would have known. If that was the case, then it would pretty much guarantee that the Brabant killers had ties inside of the police. However, it can't be verified whether or not this information was widely available to the public, or if it was something that they really would have had ties to the police to know. In any case, just a week later, on the 17th, the killers would strike again, attacking and killing a couple who had stopped at a gas station. Despite the gas station alarm going off, the killers still took a pretty considerable amount of time to steal things like coffee and cooking oil, which, that's one thing about this case, is that they always stole very, very strange stuff. A lot of food. Then, two gendarmeries arrived in response to the alarm, and they were immediately fired upon from within the building. One officer was killed, and another was gravely injured. Seeing their opening, the gang decided that it was time to get out of there, so they hopped in a car that they had brought to the robbery and sped off. Later on, that same car was found riddled with bullet holes, suggesting that the gang members had shot at the car's gas tank in an attempt to destroy it. Very notably, police recovered evidence from this car that went missing under mysterious circumstances. But after this, things get even weirder, because after a particularly violent jewelry store robbery on December 1st, the gang suddenly went dead silent. And for almost two years, Belgium was allowed to think that the nightmare was over. For the entirety of 1984, nothing even happened. A new year came and went, and then another came, and then seasons passed. Winter, spring, summer. Then, in the fall of 1985, the mad killers of Brabant returned more bloodthirsty than ever. No one really knows why, but at this point, their crimes shifted from being mostly material and motivation to almost being more about the killings themselves. On September 27th, the gang would rob two supermarkets in a row, killing eight in the process and wounding another three. Then, in November, three men approached a supermarket, firing upon and killing pedestrians in the parking lot, including a family of four. Once inside, they fired indiscriminately upon customers and staff trying to flee. Finally, the robbers themselves would take to their car and escape the scene of the crime. This robbery brought the total deaths on behalf of the killers to 28, with another 22 being seriously injured. Then, just as suddenly as the Brabant killers had returned, they vanished. No headway would be made in the case for another year, until 1986, when several items related to the killers were found in a canal just outside of Brussels. A year earlier, 
this same location had been searched by the police, and this contributed even further to suspicions that the police and the Mad Killers of Brabant had some sort of a connection. And with that, the events surrounding the Mad Killers of Brabant in the 1980s came to an end. In the years from 2005 to 2015, there was a big scramble to finally convict those responsible. This is because investigators were trying to beat the clock on the statute of limitations for the case. A special extension has been made to the statute of limitations specifically for the case of the Mad Killers of Brabant, and now it'll run out in 2025. However, after that, the gang will have officially gotten away with it. Unfortunately, as the clock ticks ever closer, the police seem to have found precious little to lead to a culprit. But that doesn't mean the truth isn't out there. Overall, there are so many little peculiarities about this case that I just find to be incredibly interesting. Why are there so many intersections with the police? Why did the criminals steal such small amounts of money relative to the big risks that they were taking on every robbery? Why did they have such a strong preference for Volkswagen cars? Seriously, they stole like, I don't know how many cars, and like 90% of them were Volkswagens. And why did they spend so much of their time stealing food rather than money? Like, that's, that's one of the weirdest things to me. Is that a common thing with robberies? But when we get down to trying to draw a conclusion about the case, I feel like there are two main possibilities that rise to the top. Taking a cursory look at the evidence and the suspicions of the investigators, it certainly seems possible that a conspiracy was at play behind closed doors within the gendarmerie and the police. But with that said, this connection has never been definitively proven. In recent years, several officers have come out claiming to be members of the Brabant Killers, with many of those claiming to be the giant himself. However, it seems like a lot of those confessions have been definitively ruled out, and absolutely none of them have been verified. Also, notice how nobody's jumping to confess to being the old man, or at least if they are, I, I kind of have to imagine that it just went something like, Son, I was the old man. We know, Dad. Yeah, you're still an old man. No! And then he just dies. <laughs> Do you think that the person who was the old man was like on his deathbed and he was just like, no, I don't want to be associated with that name. It's lame. <laughs> anyway, it could totally be the case that this is all just a testament to the negligence of the police in Belgium at the time. Uh, many of the most suspicious occurrences, such as evidence disappearing or the killers being able to get away mid-chase, could either be chalked up to conspiracy or incompetence. If you ask me what I personally believe, I think there's just a little bit too much tying the killers to the police, uh, whether that be that they were members of the police themselves, or if they just had deep ties with the police and the gendarmerie. However, with me simply being an interested individual who's researching this case through the internet from the other side of the world, for me to push that my own personal hunch is fact would be kind of foolish. So, what I really want to know is what you think. Do you believe that the Brabant Killers were just a small-time gang who stole for money and for the thrill of it? Or were they secretly a covert unit of the gendarmerie carrying out political assassinations under the guise of robberies? Honestly, there are so many possibilities for this case, and I think that I could personally go any way. So I'm really looking forward to seeing what your guys' thoughts are in the comments. And with that, I want to thank you all for watching. This video took me a lot longer to piece together than I was originally expecting for it to. Researching was pretty difficult for a couple of reasons. First of all, because the case is not super well known. And second of all, because my main source was written entirely in French. So I had a heck of a time translating everything so that I could actually assemble the full storyline. If you appreciate the amount of time and work that I put into this video, please like and share it. Uh, that way I can kind of get into the algorithm a little bit more. It helps way more than a lot of people actually realize. And finally, please subscribe if you enjoy this type of content. I've really enjoyed making these few videos, and I've already got more in the pipeline. So, I'll see you all with another upload in just a couple of days. Later, everyone.